This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. back, I made an episode of Reasonably Sound about ASMR, or Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. It's this weird, pleasant tingle that some people get on the tops of their heads, or at the base and along their spine, when they hear certain sounds. A complex of media has popped up, especially on YouTube, aimed at, quote, triggering people with ASMR. After that episode, one of the more common responses to it was a question. The question of if I'd ever consider doing an episode about misophonia, which is, for all intents and purposes, kind of the opposite of ASMR. Misophonia is a disorder where aggression Nausea, stress, and even the fight-or-flight response is triggered by certain sounds. It's not a phobia. Misophonia is not characterized by fear or anxiety. There's not dread or terror. Just loathing. It is literally the hatred of sounds. Not all sounds, though. Akin to how certain sounds trigger ASMR in certain people and do not trigger it in others, misophoniacs react negatively to certain sounds, and those sounds vary depending upon the individual. Misophonia is sometimes called selective sound sensitivity syndrome, which, if you are or know someone with misophonia, is just like... That description comes across as the most coddling, precious understatement of what it's like to reflexively enrage in the presence of certain auditory stimuli. We're going to talk to someone with misophonia in a couple minutes, actually. My partner Molly, who hasn't been diagnosed, but the diagnosing of misophonia is a weird thing to begin with. Anyways, it's not official, but from what we can tell, it seems like she has misophonia. Um, And we're going to talk to her for most of this episode, actually, about the above description, what it's like to have misophonia, what it feels like, and so on and so forth. But before we do that, I just, I want to talk a little bit more about some generalities. As of right now, misophonia is not included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This doesn't mean it's not real, only that the very large and very slow to update, quote, universal authority for psychiatric diagnosis hasn't included it as its own distinct disorder. Diagnostic criteria does exist elsewhere for misophonia, but due, perhaps, to the number of people who suffer for it, the nature of its symptoms, or the fact that it's absent from the DSM, it's a pretty rare thing to know about, even for people who have it. 
And if you do have it, there are certain classes, it turns out, of sound which are common triggers for folks with misophonia. Eating sounds are a big one. Forks scraping on plates, silverware hitting teeth, chewing, slurping, smacking, clicking and rubbing sounds like pen caps being removed and replaced, a pen or pencil tip on paper, paper rustling or being slid across a surface. They're all high on the list as are footsteps and other movement-related sounds. And sounds which, for most of us, we might identify them as irritating. Dogs barking, babies crying, horns honking, alarms beeping, but which, for misophoniacs, classify as somewhere between unbearable and hulk levels of rage-inducing. Maybe if y'all stopped making such a racket all the time, we wouldn't know what Bruce Banner is like when he's angry. Hmm? You ever think about that? Anyways, it's worth noting here that the rage is not induced by a kind of physical hypersensitivity. There's a separate condition called hyperacusis, where the sufferer experiences, quote, dizziness, nausea, or a loss of balance when sounds of certain pitches are present. For people with hyperacusis, simply being out in the world can be tough because it's not particular sounds and therefore particular situations which can be avoided. It's particular frequencies and sonic information potentially present in any situation. It's been shown, actually, that many misophoniacs don't even react to their own trigger sounds in every situation, suggesting it's not the sound itself, but often the context in which it occurs, or the person producing it. Relatedly, there are a bunch of ways misophoniacs can manage their symptoms, the aggressiveness or anger that results. Headphones, earplugs, positive affirmation, and so on, but one of them is for the misophoniac themselves to produce their trigger sound. In practice, I'm not sure what this looks like. You're at a restaurant and someone is clinking their silverware together, so you clink yours. Someone's breathing heavily, so you begin to breathe heavily as well. Frequently, if not mostly, I've read some conflicting things. Misophoniacs are not triggered by sounds so much as they are triggered by certain sounds made by certain people. But I guess themselves, they are not on that list of triggering people. Most misophoniacs report that their first experience of misophonia was in their early teens in response to sounds made by a family member, and that in the event they continue to suffer, they can point to a small group of people, if not a single person, with whom they are very close, responsible for making the sounds that make them cringe. And on that note, we are joined by Molly Templeton. Hello. With whom I live and who has some of these sensitivities and who I'm sure I drive crazy constantly with the terrible sounds that I make. Um, so, uh, thank you for agreeing to talk to me about the fact that you hate some, some noises. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm not causing you any undue anxiety by, by asking you to describe your experiences. Not at all. I love complaining. <laughs> if, uh, if at any point the conversation gets too real, you just let me know and we can. Are you going to play some fork scraping sounds? No, maybe? definitely, definitely not. I was wondering if just to start things off, you could describe the sensation that you experience when you hear a sound mm. that triggers your, you know, what we what we're assuming is misophonia because it's not diagnosed. Um, It's quite a physical sensation when I hear something that I really don't like and I sort of feel like a shiver coming up my back almost. And usually, and like right now I'm feeling, I'm like, you know, I'm like ghosting it for myself and I feel it coming up over my right shoulder. And it's just sort of like, um, you know, when you, uh, I don't know, like everyone does that, right? Where you just like, oh, I have to shake something off like the Jubilees. Okay. Feels a little bit like that, but I, I feel it longer in some sense. Like I can feel it coming and it, 
it's very painful and I'd rather not. Right. Like you, you anticipate it a little bit. Yeah. The anticipation is kind of the whole feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, you know, when I did the ASMR episode, people asked, there were a lot of requests to do an episode about misophonia, which is mm-hmm. essentially the opposite, right? It's like the, like terrible aversion or aggression towards. Yeah. And, uh, I thought that it would be like, I want to, I, I find it interesting and there's like all of these things that I can read, but you know, I felt a certain amount of ownership or authority in talking about ASMR. Cause it's a thing that like sort of, that I think sort of happens to me occasionally, mm-hmm. but I don't experience this, this feeling about sounds. I don't think at all. And yeah. so having someone here to like sort of th- talk authoritatively about it or, you know, to do, <laughs> okay. Maybe not authoritatively, but to, from experience yeah to describe I to describe so. their actual embodied experience of it it's strange because i don't think I, I now i'm trying to think if i have pleasurable experiences with sounds and i can't think of anything well there must be songs that you like yeah but it's not a feeling it's not like i always assume that people who enjoy like asmr videos feel certain things like when i read them recapping what they I don't know. And certain people seem to feel that way about music, and I don't feel that way. Right. I don't feel physically about sound at all. You just like the ideas in the lyrics. Yeah, the only thing that makes me feel... I've watched a bunch of ASMR videos, and the only one that works kind of for me, but I think I'm trying to make it work for me, is the cotton bud ones. Can you describe it? The ear cleaning ones. What? Yeah, the ones that are like, well, I'm not going to be able to do it because I don't have a cotton bud. But <laughs> <it's> <laughs> like, what like, do people? What is the object that someone has? I assume a cotton bud. Is that is that a cotton ball or is that an ear? Oh, um, a Q-tip. A sorry. Q-tip. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Q-tip. Okay. And what and what do they do with it? They they simulate someone cleaning your ears. What? That's you crazy. Never heard these? No, I've never heard these. I've never even seen this. Oh yeah. Because I, I think it's because I really like cleaning my ears. And I always really like cleaning my ears because I think my mom cleaned my ears when I was a baby, which is like how babies get their ears cleaned, right? right? Yeah. I still really like it. And when I hear those things, it feels like... The, <laughs> it's weird to say it feels like the sound. <laughs> it feels like the sound in my ear. Although it, I know it's not, so it doesn't really give me a feeling, but it's the closest thing that I found that's pleasurable. Right. Anyway, but things I hate... <laughs> Uh, moving on. <laughs> Are there? Do you remember the f- the first time that you ever had this reaction to a noise, to a sound? Um, I don't want to throw my entire family under the bus, but <laughs> yeah, my my sister's a fork scraper. Yeah. And I don't know. I I have like certain aversions to texture, and it's gotten a lot better as I've gotten older. But I really didn't like metal utensils for a lot of my life, and I would use plastic cutlery. Um, and I didn't like metal utensils cutting on porcelain or china plates or like yeah i just don't like metal and ceramic i don't really like anything on ceramic actually yeah (laughs) i don't really like ceramic at all um but i would have plastic utensils and as much as i could like plastic plates and sort of stuff but my sister didn't have that aversion so she grew out of plastic (laughs) and um and she would also scrape her teeth which is a thing i still cannot stand Right where someone bites down on a fork and oh, then... Why yeah. would you? Sometimes you just, you know, as someone, I'm sure, who makes a ton of sounds that drive you crazy because yeah. we live together. I mean, I'm sure I make all kinds of crazy noises that yeah, are... Sometimes that, you scrape your fork and yeah, it drives that, me nuts. Yeah, and I, like, I don't even, you know, why <laughs> would you is such a hard thing to answer because... But why would you? Like, it's such... It doesn't even feel... <laughs> beyond the fact that it makes a horrible sound, it's not good for your teeth to do that. Why wouldn't you just, like, cover your teeth with your lip? I think a lot of people just don't realize they're even doing it. It's not even a why would you. It's like, oh, am I even doing that? Yeah, I hate the vibration. I hate contacting my teeth with metal. I hate the sound of it um i mean i don't you're not throwing your family under the bus it's actually it's actually a pretty common thing that Mm -hmm. people who have misophonia like it's it has there's like a particular either person or Mm. set of people almost always their family that they identify as being the source of this feeling another one that i kind of just recently realized because you bought mayonnaise the other day oh no is mayonnaise i hate things that are textured like that it's taken me it took me like 24 years of my life to be able to eat Greek yogurt, you know? And like, I'm really weird about yogurt. You know that. 
I have to have like really smooth, silky, like smoothie like yogurt. But that doesn't have anything to do. You're not. You, but it you, does. You, it has to do with sound. Like you have an aversion <laughs> to like. It's not. No, that's fine. I like that sound. Okay. It's the sound when someone puts something that's a texture like that that's kind of sticky. Yeah. Like that's why probably why I don't like eggs, honestly, or things that are made of eggs. It's the sound of it being in the corners of their mouth. <laughs> I hate hearing someone eat a sandwich that is wet. I don't even... I mean, I can imagine what that sound is like, but I don't... I have such a... Right, I mean, for lack of a... I'm, de- I'm almost deaf to these things. That, that It's this, like... imagine. So imagine you, like, salivated a lot, and it's like... Right. That sound is just horrible. And when that's, so when someone has sort of has that sound naturally or so like people have that sound when they're eating normally because you salivate more when you're eating. So when that's combined with a dressing like mayonnaise, it's just not good. And that's and the same thing with cream cheese, right? I used to be really creeped out by cream cheese. Yeah. And it's partly because of the texture. It's partly because of the dairy and uh, but also because of the sound. So do you think it's fair to say that all of the things that trigger you are food related? Are there any others? No, no, there are others. What are the other ones? <laughs> well, you you were telling me about the ones that you tell me tell me set me off the other day. You get really angry um, when I make clicking noises. I hate tapping and clicking and like. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't say you don't get angry. You forcefully. It just irritates me. Forcefully request that I that I cease. It's just really irritating. It's not quite as physical. Like I'm not repulsed by it. But <laughs> but it really irritates me when I hear someone like clicking a pen or actually even when I like see someone like really shaking their foot in a meeting or like I remember I have a, like very vivid memories of people in school who would do it a lot and I find it very distracting. Do you find footsteps irritating? No. Cuz these are actually the three most common classes of sounds that trigger misophonia in people it's food sounds um like repetitive tapping noises and and foot like footsteps and foot noises i don't mind feet and like people who have had it for a while or people who have sort of dealt with their dislike of these sounds for a long time what ends up happening apparently is that it turns into also a visual trigger yeah, I definitely have that. Yeah. Are these sounds that happen all the time? Like, do you feel like you are constantly in the presence of these things that you have this strong dislike of? No, I, I don't. they don't bother me as much as I've gotten older. Where are the places that, are there places that you identify as being potential sources of discomfort? Well, yeah. Am I one of them? Um, no, no, I don't. I'm not like fearful of noises that you're going to make. I am scared when we go to shows that I don't know what the music's going to be like because sometimes, because I am open to all of the things that you enjoy, but sometimes I don't know if it's just going to be clicking for an hour. Right. Like um, some guy gets up on stage wearing a velour jumpsuit tap. and clicks a pen for 45 minutes. That sounds so horrible. But also, weirdly, within the realm of possibility of something that I might take you to. Absolutely. <laughs> I am so sorry. No, that's fine. I volunteer. <laughs> I know I got into. Um, yeah, home. Like, like, uh, my 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 parents' house. Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just like heightened to their the things that they do that irritate me, or if it's like, this is gonna sound weird, but it's, it feels more real. When I'm at my parents' house than anywhere else. Yeah. The the sensations that I have in response to sound and texture are heightened at my parents' house. I mean, it's a probably a t- more tense situation than I am in with more familiar activities. Because when I'm there, it's like long stretches of time where there's not necessarily anything going on. It's kind of just people who don't live together every day being in a house for a long time not doing anything and living like they do live together all the time and so maybe you're already thinking about all of the little details anyways <laughs> and that's one of the details that you're like oh my god i hope this doesn't oh my god. i like them all very much i just really hate certain things it's okay it's not it's this we're not yeah. leveraging judgment on them i know yeah and then the other th- sound that i really don't like that 
also comes up when we get a certain show together or you put on like a new record is that like low vibration sound which i had never experienced until a few years ago you described um the eating sounds as a Mm. kind of like raising raising of the hairs on your back almost (laughs) frustration and then you described the clicking as just anger oh it's just not anger irritation not anger irritation (laughs) um no the the like low sounds i feel claustrophobic and i feel like i can't breathe yeah yeah it's the the scraping and the like I guess they're high pitched. They feel shrill to me, yeah. like physically shrill. And then the the low sounds and the the deep vibrations feel like pressure on my lungs. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like my diaphragm doesn't expand properly and I can't breathe. And does that have to do with volume or just the sound? No. Just the, the low tone? Mm-hmm. If you're out walking on the street and a car with a big engine drives by, do you feel the same way? Uh, it really depends. Not really. But sometimes certain things on the street do bother me. I guess what I'm asking is if, if you have any sense of if it's the context or the actual frequencies. I don't know. Do all of the sounds that cause you to have a negative reaction have a visual component to them as well? Like, if you were to shut your eyes and just hear those things, do you think you would have the same reaction? Yeah. Yeah. Because, and I think... The low sound is the one that demonstrates that the best because I don't have any visual association. It just makes me feel like I can't breathe. True. Um, yeah, but I don't think, like, I don't think, oh, no, I don't know. Now I'm thinking about, uh, <laughs> I have a very active imagination. So also when I hear some of these sounds, I see the visuals. Yeah. Yeah. I I can't even hear someone really stack ceramic plates without... You see Thinking it about then... the bottom of the plate where it's rough and mm-hmm. not treated. And I, and that sound of that texture. <laughs> hmm. No good. Yeah. I, no, no, no. I feel like it's just another part of materials that make me feel uncomfortable. Right. And maybe that extends to environments and I didn't realize that. And when there is, when you're in a situation, like let's say you're at home or I'm stacking plates downstairs or something, yeah, and you start to feel this way, is there a thing? Because I, I mean, it seems like based upon the things that I've read, there are people who suffer from this so much that they dread going out into the world because a lot of it has to do with the anxiety of going to a place where they're going to feel out of, not in control because Mm. of the feelings that they'll have in relationship to these sounds Mm -hmm. so and you're not you're not nearly i've never dreaded doing anything because i might hear something right but when you do start to have this feeling is there like a a thing that you do or do you just sort of bear it Uh, like a coping mechanism it really depends like i was saying before it's like endurance i can probably undergo all of them for a certain period of time although some of them make me like immediately have a physical reaction if i'm like looking and hearing it um and hearing them like the fork right uh makes me shudder yeah but some but some of them i have less tolerance for and the ones that you have less tolerance for what do you do in those situations i never even considered wearing earplugs before until we started going to shows that had low tones in them and now i plug my ears yeah when i hear sounds i don't like and i don't i mean i it depends on the situation because i because i'm more focused on other people than I am my own discomfort. (laughs) No, this makes perfect. So this is actually my next question. Yeah. Which is that a lot of people who have misophonia feel really guilty about having it. They they feel like jerks. They feel like they are overreacting. Yeah. It's really weird to have textural sensitivities and to have that like represent itself to me with sound and visuals. Right. I think I feel like that's what it is for me. But then again, like the low sound. So yeah, it's really weird to have that. I'd rather not have it. I'd rather not make other people feel bad for things that they don't know that they're doing. And also, it's usually pretty brief. The fork scraping, most people don't make the sound that really bothers me. So if they do it once and they do the like, shh, they probably won't do it again. Or if they do, they'll do it sparingly. Um, or the meal will be over soon and that's okay. <laughs> you just learn, you just deal with it. Or like if I'm at home, I can move away. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Uh, you can or, turn to me and say, hey, how do you want to take Jack out for a walk around the block? Or I can like shift my focus. As lo- if I'm not, I-, I can think about something else and like turn my imagination onto something else rather than like, I hear this thing and it makes me feel this way. Right. Some of them I can't get away from. And that's when it comes to the like uncomfortable endurance thing. And it makes me feel more like, it's like, like very similar to like running. I find running very uncomfortable, but I enjoy it because... Uh, <laughs> enjoy, enjoy is maybe a, yeah like a enjoy in scare quotes yeah so the low sounds i actually really don't enjoy <laughs> but i enjoy being with you and i enjoy that it makes you happy that i come to the shows with you so i like i'm trying to endure them for longer and longer but i'm not training very well <laughs> and as and i'm as i take you to shows that are longer and longer and lower and lower they're so long what is a what is an unbearable thing that uh you could take me to um probably... unbearable for me i mean we could go to the very um spiritual yoga class together oh man i don't know if i could do it that's a different kind of un- that's like that's not a physical reaction that i'll have that's um my cynicism kicking in (laughs) well what do i like that you absolutely hate really bad television yeah most people say that about me really (laughs) yeah i actually and i don't know one of the things that bothers me the most about really bad tv is the way it sounds you hate sitcoms i hate over shows that have an over compressed laugh track yeah my dad's the same way i think it's like it's uh, it's not like fingernails on a blackboard, but it just it it distract. I find it so distracting. I have a very high tolerance for sitcoms. Sitcoms. <laughs> um, Love Full House. And good night. Uh, thank you for um, coming twenty five feet upstairs to the studio to talk with me about things that make you um, bristle. Thanks for letting me be on your podcast. Yeah. High five. High five. We don't actually have to. It's a podcast. No, now we have to. <laughs> oh. Okay. You will be happy to know that after recording this, I did not go downstairs and rub forks on all of our plates. We just went to go watch some sitcoms. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been reasonably sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND. And you can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Mike Rugnetta. And I will let Molly tell you where you can find her on the internet. You can find me on the internet at Mimi Molly on Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr or probably anywhere, honestly. Just have a Google. (laughs) 